you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 22. You don't necessarily need your Bible to, to follow along. Uh, you can get it uh, on the screen. We'll have it here or digital Bible, whatever. Uh, we do encourage you to, to, there's just something about like physically holding like the word of God. It, it's nice. I, I know I, at times I try to like do devotions on my phone uh, when I read uh, and, and, and I just go sideways really, really fast. Like I just lose it really, really quickly, but uh, it's hard to it's hard to check Facebook when you actually just have the Bible in your hands. So um, I don't know, just a little tidbit there. So hey, 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 here we are, Genesis 22. If this is your first Sunday, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. You're kind of jumping in um, at, at the end of the story here. We this is week 27 on the life of Abraham. The series follow the Abraham series that we've been doing. We've got uh, three, possibly four more weeks, depends on on where we go from there. We're gonna we're gonna be looking at probably. Uh, one of the most hotly contested chapters of Scripture uh, today and, and next week. It's going to be a two-part series. And so let's just dive in just really quickly. Genesis chapter 22, starting in verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, Here am I. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Morai, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. And we're going to stop right here, and, and I know it feels counterintuitive, to, but, but we're not going to get much further in Genesis chapter 22 than verses 1 or 2, because this is one of the, the most hotly contested uh, sections of Scripture in, in, in the entire Bible. People that aren't believers will point to this section of Scripture as some kind of evidence that, that the God of the Bible is some kind of fraud. You know, uh, you, people will hear, uh, non, you know, that, that God is love and, and Jesus loves you and all that kind of stuff. But then they'll go, well, what about Genesis 22 when that, that same God says to Abraham, sacrifice and kill your only son? And, and they point to it as, as some evidence that, that the God of the, the Bible, the God of the Old Testament is just some bloodthirsty uh, God that, that's part of a pantheon of gods that, that just whatever, Uh, some people point to this uh, to, to, to this interaction and say, how could a, a, a good God, you say that God is good, how could a good God ask a, a, a father to sacrifice his only son for some perceived self-imposed righteousness? I've even heard in having conversations about this section of Scripture, people ask this question, who does God think that he is? The, the problem with all of these trains of thought is the, the presupposition that God's intent was the death of Isaac. Let me say that again. The, the, the problem with all of those trains of thoughts or those questions was that God's intent was the death of Isaac. That when God said, sacrifice your son, he was, his intent was that, 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 that Isaac was going to be dead on top of a mountain. I don't think that that was God's intent. I don't think that God ever intended for Isaac to be sacrificed. When you even look at that word in the original language, all, all it's saying is give to me. Now he does say offer as a burnt offering and, and we'll deal with that next week as we, as we think about it. But what we have to understand is what God is doing here in Genesis chapter 22 and it's foundational to the walk of a believer. And so like what we talk about today, I was telling the team earlier, uh, I don't ever want to presuppose that, that people know all of this stuff. I'm going to guess that, that probably the majority of the people in, in this room today are going to have, you'll have heard this message at some point. But there's 20%, did I say 80% have heard it? I just want to make sure I did the math right. Majority. Okay, sweet. So I could I shouldn't have said anything. You guys are just going with me. It's like cowboy fans. We'll believe anything the news tells us. I'm a Cowboys fan, by the way. And they're gonna lose. So there I said it. But it's foundational to your walk as a believer, whether you've been a Christian for fifty years or you've been a Christian for a hot minute. What we're going to talk to, about today is foundational to your ability to grow and mature. 
And maybe you're part of that group that says, oh, well, wait a second, I thought the Bible said that, that, that God would never, would, would never test us. Like you're one of those people that, that point to this chapter in the Bible and say, this doesn't seem fair. What is God doing? And you've got all kinds of questions. I'm glad that you're here today. Because that's a flawed question. We say, well, well I thought he said that, that the Bible said that, 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 that God was never supposed to test us. It, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is what you're doing, but it's kind of what Satan did in the, in the wilderness with, with Jesus. He quotes scripture and twists it just a little bit. The Bible doesn't say that God isn't supposed to test us. What it says in James 1, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. And so th this isn't a, a spot on your bulletin or on your sermon guide. If you've got this, uh, I would invite you to, to take it out and take notes. There's, there's notes on the inside there and on the back. There's questions for further study. You can read it. Uh, sometimes there's books for additional reading. But this isn't a, a, a spot for you to read. But I think it's important enough that maybe you might want to write it down. And it's this, that there's, there's a difference between being tested and being tempted, God certainly will test us. God will put us in the midst of a trial, and, and there's a reason that he does that. And, it, and when, when God does that, or God, when, when God puts us in a test, the test is used to affirm what you've learned. That, that's a note on your sermon guide. They'll put that up on the screen. A test is used to affirm or to, to show us what you've learned, right? We, we, we all take tests. How many of you are in school? Anybody got a test this next week coming up? Or a presentation of some sorts. My daughter's giving me a, an evil look because she's got a presentation on, on Monday morning, first thing. The teacher did a random draw and she just did it alphabetical and our last name is B and so Savannah gets to go first. What happens when you take a test and you get that back? Well, what do you have on the top of that page? I can't hear you, Mikey, say it. A grade. What does that grade tell us? It tells us what we've learned, right? Right? The easy question is the, the easy question is the easy answer is it tells us if we've we've passed or failed, but that's not actually what it tells us. It, it tells us that grade tells us what we've learned. You get an A plus, you're a nerd. You've learned it all. I never got an A plus ever once. B, you get a B. You learned the material pretty good, right? You knew most of it pretty good. You get a C, what's that, what's that great saying? C's get degrees? Let's go, that's my degree, I got a C. You kind of learn the material, but for high school, guess what? You're still eligible to play in the game. That's what C's mean, that tells us what we've learned. D's, man, you, you kind of, you guessed some of it right, but most of it you didn't know, and if you get an F, what? Failure, you didn't learn the material at all. You didn't learn anything. And so when you go through a test, what it's doing when you're in a test is it's affirming what you've learned. So Abraham finds himself in the midst of a test. He's fixing to go through the biggest trial he's ever gone through. And at the end, we're going to learn a little bit about what Abraham learned. He, he's going to show or express what he's learned about God in the last 10 chapters of, of Genesis, the last 25 years of his life he's been in school for 25 years and genesis 22 is the test of his lifetime and what did he learn now i'm going to tell you what he learned next week so just put a pause or a semicolon or whatever is the proper punctuation for next week but that's not the only thing that a test is used for a test is also used to produce strength or faith A test is used to produce additional strength or faith. Any weightlifters in here? Nobody lifts weights. I know one person lifts weights. Where are you at? Where's Chad at? There he is. He's going to raise his hand. Chad and I lift weights. I haven't lifted in a while. I've got a, a back problem, I, some compressed vertebra or whatever. But um, when I first started lifting with Chad, I would, he'd be like, well, what do you want on there? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't lifted in like 20 years. Well, what do you think I should put on there? And he would take some ungodly amount of weight and put it on the bar. And I'm like, let, let me, let, well, just one second. I haven't lifted in years. I haven't bench pressed in years. And you want me to do, you want me to do this? That's what you're bench pressing. 
You know, the very first thing that he said to me lifting the weights, he probably doesn't remember this. You remember what he said to me? You don't know, but do you remember what you said to me? He doesn't, he's shaking his head. He said, you're a big boy. How do you know if you don't try? I was like, dude, I quit. I wanted to walk out. So I'm like, okay. And, and I laid down on the bench and I, we did the thing and lo and behold, I did it. And you know what he said to me next? Do you remember what you said to me? No, you don't remember? He goes, well, we didn't go heavy enough. And he started grabbing more weights and putting it on. I was like, I should have struggled a little bit more. What was I thinking? But, but I learned something valuable in that moment, right? That, that test, it was a test of strength for me. Can I do it or can I not do it? And if all you're ever doing is the minimum required, you're never going to gain any additional strength. If all you ever do is go lay down on the bench bar and press just the bench bar, just the 45 pounds, you're never going to get any stronger. Might you get more toned and defined? Absolutely you might, but you ain't got any strength. You're still just, as Arnold Schwarzenegger used to say back in the 80s, a little girly man. If you want to get stronger, if you want to produce more faith in your life, you have to be in situations that will allow you to produce that strength and or faith in your walk of following Jesus. Anybody ever here pray for patience? You shouldn't. It's a horrible prayer to pray. I'm just kidding. Go, God, would you give me patience? And then he sends that person in your life that just requires patience. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody, I see the nodding, knowing nods. You ask for God to bless your family. And then what you get is a constant stream of people needing things from your family. Now, listen, it's an opportunity for your family to be blessed because when you're a blessing, you also get that blessing back. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about like, you know, maybe the opportunity to to provide a meal for somebody. We've got, we've got a couple of opportunities in our church right now. We have some people that, that need to be blessed with meal trains. Uh, uh, Jeremy and his wife just had their baby last week and there's a meal train for that. And man, there's nothing better than walking into somebody's house and going, hey, here's a home cooked meal for your family. And the kids love it. And, and mom and dad are so happy because they don't have to figure out dinner tonight. I, I think if, if I were to ask the question, said, who in this room wants to be more like Jesus? I think every hand would be raised. Maybe some of you might be like halfway raised. You're like, I'm, I'm still out on Jesus. I'm not sure, but I kind of like what I'm hearing. But for those of us that want to be more like Jesus, let's look just for, just for a second at, at the beginning of his ministry, right? He, he's growing and then he's, he's baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin. The, the spirit descends. God, the voice from heaven says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then what does he do? He immediately goes to the desolate place. He immediately goes to the desert for 40 days of fasting and prayer. I can't go 40 minutes for fasting. I can go four minutes for prayer before my mind starts to wander. He went 40 days of fasting and prayer, and then he comes back. He leaves the desert place. He leaves the wilderness and comes back into the city, and what's What's happened as he walks in, he immediately begins to be attacked by the enemy. It's a refining process in the life of Jesus and the ministry that the Father allows to happen because he knows that Jesus needs to go through it in preparation for what's to come, for the greater test that's down the road. The book of Hebrews calls what we're going through a temporary light affliction that it may produce in us something worthy of praise to God the Father. A test is used to produce additional strength or faith. James 1 says it this way, starting in verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. First Peter chapter 1 says it this way. So this is the apostle James and the brother of Jesus, and Peter who walked with Jesus day after day says it in this way in First Peter 1, starting in verse 5. 
who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Anybody going through anything today? Anybody feel grieved by what you're going through? Just keep reading in verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to be result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The proper application of resistance allows for one to grow stronger. If you never have resistance, you're never going to grow in your faith. If all you read, now listen, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. If all you ever read is the Gospels, you're missing so much. I love the Gospels. I love the story of Jesus. I love Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians. But you have to be willing to get into the entirety of Scripture. There are parts of the Bible that we're going to deal with next year when we look at, when we look at the life of Moses and we get into the Exodus. There are going to be parts of Scripture that are hard to read, that are harder to read than what we're reading today. You have to work through those things. We have to understand what God is doing and why. What you're going through today isn't just, it's not just flippant or whatever. It's not a happenstance or a flip of the coin. What you're going through today is you're going through for a reason so that it may produce in you a steadfastness so when Jesus is revealed, you may result in the glory that comes with knowing him and knowing the Father. You have to have resistance if you want to build strength. Now we said that there's a difference between uh, uh, being tested in temptation and what I want to spend the bulk of our time today, the, re the rest of our time today, is looking at temptation. Uh, Abraham is not being tempted here. He is being tested. Temptation is something completely different. It, and you have to understand the difference between a test and temptation to really understand what's happening in Genesis chapter 22. And so before we dive into the rest of that next week, we're going to look at James chapter 1, and we're going to look at the life cycle of temptation and what it means and how it works in the life of a believer. Can we do that today? Are you guys good with that? Have you, guys, have you ever heard this before, the life cycle of temptation, how it works in your life? So I see some yeses. I see some noes. This is good, man. I think, I think this is going to be good for us. James chapter 1. Uh, what's that say? My eyes are really bad. 13. When tempted, no one should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God not be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And starting in verse 14, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Stage one, you can write them down right here. Temptation stages, I think is what we're, we're calling it. Stage one, it's uh, blaming God or avoiding responsibility. That's verse 13. You can write that out there next to it. Stage one is blaming God or avoiding responsibility. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, right? We, they, it started way back in the beginning in the garden. A, 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 Adam blamed Eve. Cain and Abel. It's the story of our lives. Anybody have a brother or sister growing up? I didn't do it. They did it. I know Aaron and Dana still do it today, and they're both like, they're way mature than they were when they were 12 or 13. You got kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We automatically avoid, we automatically blame others. We don't want to accept responsibility. We want to, we want to flee from it. As we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, uh, that's, our, that's our inclination when we, when we have an argument or there's an issue, we want to flee from it, when actually we should run towards that argument. We should, we should try and clear the air. It's the same thing with sin or temptation. Don't blame other people for your stupid mistakes Jay Boyd at MiddlestonGrace.com if you don't like the, that word <clears throat> you make a bad choice and you find yourself stuck in the, in the mud and the muck and the mire and you're like what's going on don't blame other people understand the bad choice that you made accept that responsibility Understand where you're at and why you're where you are. Don't blame other people. 
Stage two, this is found in verse 14 and 15. Uh, the sta second stage of this temptation is seduction. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Uh, leave, that, leave that up there for a couple of, just leave it up there until we go to the next one, fellas. Dude, can we, can we just be really honest? Can, can I, this is your first Sunday, I, I apologize. We'll just be really honest, okay? Sin is fun, isn't it? I mean, let's just be honest. Initially, it's fun. You, you look, if, 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 you're, if you're a guy that struggles with stuff on, on, on phone or online that you shouldn't, it may start innocently, but it grows and it develops into something more. It's seductive and it's cruel and it's a desire to entice you and entrap you. Ladies, if it, 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 I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to say, you know, only women struggle with this, only guys struggle with this, but, but ladies, like if you struggle with gossip, it, isn't it enticing to know that little tidbit? Like you hear it for the first time and you're like, oh, really? And then you, we cover it like, and then all Christians do this, right? We cover it up like, we really should pray for them. And you'd be like, well, I want to pray for them completely. Tell me more. But it's seductive, isn't it? It's like that weed in the garden. If you pull it out when it's small, it's easy to pull out. But if you leave for vacation and you come back and it's nine feet tall, it takes a chainsaw and a 20 mule team to pull the thing out. It has a way of working its roots down deep into our hearts and into our lives. And all the while we're just looking at it and going, oh, look, this is just, we're like Gollum saying, my precious. Any, any, any fans of The Office, the TV show The Office in here? I won't judge you if you raise your hand, okay? You guys remember the episode where um, they, the, the, the salespeople break up into teams and Dwight gets first pick and he picks, oh, Michael. And they go and they get the fruit baskets. You guys remember this episode I'm talking about? If you don't, it's really good. Well, they're driving and, and Michael and his, his convertible Sebring um, <laughs> I know it's a Sebring because my young life leader drove one, uh, met Jesus in a Sebring. Uh, yeah, it was, it's awesome. Um, they're, they're driving in the GPS or they're going to the next, their next sales stop. And Michael's following the GPS and the GPS says, turn right. Okay, I'm gonna set the stage for you, okay? They're in the car and, and let's pretend I'm on a road right here. You guys following me? Everybody got this? Okay. This is a road, but this isn't a road. This is a boat ramp that leads into a lake. Okay. And then up here is another road that goes down this way that, that goes by the lake. Right. Everybody got the, that visual? Now think of the worst driver you know and put him in the driver's seat. All right, here we go. Michael's driving along with Dwight and they're following the, the GPS and the GPS, it's new technology at the time. And it says, turn right. So Michael does what? He turns right. But he's right here, so he turns right. Where is he headed? The lake. Dwight's sitting in the right-hand seat saying, no, no, it means veer right. It means go up and veer to the right. Don't turn right, Michael. And Michael's going, no, no, it says turn right. And so Michael begins to turn right, and Dwight's hitting the dash and saying, no, 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 no. And they end up in the lake, and the fruit's floating around everywhere. James, in chapter 1, is sitting here saying it starts with seduction. He's saying, no, no, no. Don't do that thing that you're looking at. Don't DM that person. Don't cheat on your taxes. Don't run the stop sign. No, no, no. It starts with seduction, but what it ends is you in a lake surrounded by floating fruit, losing everything. Don't do it. Stay away from it. 
when you're in the when you're in the middle of the lake, it's it's conception is the third stage. After desire, after that seduction, it's conceived. Conception has begun. Then it doesn't become looking. It becomes more. It becomes acting upon. And those weeds slowly grow deeper into the heart of your soil, the soil of your heart. And once what was an easy pulling of a, of a temptation or a weed out of the garden now becomes something altogether more difficult. Stage four is birth. It's no longer a thought. It's no longer a temptation. It's now an act of sin in your life. It's now something that maybe you keep hidden in the closet and nobody else knows about. But it's a living, growing thing in your life now that's sucking away and pulling away from you the things that only belong to God. It's beginning to get your worship. It's beginning to get your time. It's beginning to get your attention when those things should only be going to one and that's the creator of the universe who sits enthroned in heaven. And the thing with birth and sin is Right, Things that are alive, we have a tendency to nurture and want to grow. And it becomes even more difficult to remove once it becomes this living thing that's a part of your life. Stage 5, verse 15, is growth. What started out as a thought, then a little act, now it's a baby. Now it becomes full grown. And it comes out of nowhere, y'all. I mean, it, it just, it comes out of nowhere and it smacks you like an 18-wheeler going 90 miles an hour on the highway. It, it, I, it, it, I don't even think, I, I haven't told Becky this yet because we got home yesterday and then uh, Harper was at a, at, a, at, a, at a football party or something. I don't know. I went to go pick her up and then I had to swing by John and Marianne's place to pick up the key for the trailer. We have a trailer that most of what you see up here on the stage goes into a trailer at the end of service every every day, and we lock it, and I had to get the key because they had it last week to unlock it. So we got it, and they live on um, Cemetery in Goodson. Okay, so, you know, Cemetery, and then when you're headed west, the, the next road is, um, is that one Emmett? Yeah, it's Emmett. You guys know what I'm talking about? Well, you, so when you come into Goodson and you go down Emmett, there's a little house on the right that's got the cute flowers along the fence, but it goes downhill to that stop sign. So we were coming home about 7.45. There's some really bad sun glare. I couldn't see, I'd, I'd been gone for a week. I really wasn't paying attention and I hit that stop sign going 55 miles an hour. Now, I'm here today, so obviously we didn't get hit. And there wasn't really a car that was close. But that's what happens with sin. You're just cruising along 55 miles an hour. You're loving life. Everything's great. Everything's going beautiful. And then it's just a stop sign. And it's just uh, 90 miles an hour right in your face. And here's what's the ultimate problem with the life cycle of sin. You know what it leads to? You know what the last stage is? Death. Where Jesus equals life, sin equals death. And in the life of a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus. It doesn't mean your, your spiritual death or separation from God, but it can mean the death of a multitude of things. It could be the death of a relationship. It could be the death of trust in a relationship. For the non-believer, that death means death. Not a physical death, but also a spiritual death, a separation from God for eternity. And so listen, if you're in this room and you're like, and you're like I'm still, I'm, I'm still kind of out. I'm, I'm not sure where I'm at on the Jesus thing. The result of sin in your life and my life is, is death. For the wages of sin is death. Comma, but the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus loved you so much that he sent his son, sound familiar, on a hill 
and sacrifice them for you and for me so you don't have to suffer that stage six of the life cycle of sin. It doesn't have to result in your spiritual death. You can know Christ and Him crucified. He can be a part of your life. He can be a part of what you want. Temptation, when it's uh, left unchecked, brings death. As the worship team makes their way up to lead us in this last song, we've got that last point we want to look at. But a trial when endured, it brings life. A trial when endured brings life. You have a choice today, church. I don't know where you're at or what you got going on, whether it's sin in your life or uh, maybe it's a trial that you're going through. You can't always control all of it, but what you can control is your response to it. And so you get to choose today. Am I going to continue down the road or am I going to learn and I'm going to grow? You get to choose that today. You get to make that choice. So, so as you ponder that, as you think about that, would you do me a favor? Would you stand and would you sing this last song with us as Heather leads us in this last song?